On this episode, I talk with a former Navy SEAL, Nick, who goes through how they would make decisions, how they apply that to the civilian world, how you can be a better leader and uh, get out of stressful situations. It's a really amazing episode. I'm so honored to have uh, Nick on the show and you guys are going to really love it. Hey, Nick, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me, Jason. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on. So tell us who you are and what do you do? Well, my name is Nick Norris. I uh, I guess I would be known as a, a former SEAL by by a lot of people, right? That's that's why I've I've connected with people. Um, but I currently am an entrepreneur. Uh, I have a company called Protect Products. And we are in the wellness space, producing supplements and sun care products. And our supplements are geared toward uh, improving people's hydration and helping them sleep better. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, first off, thanks for your service, um, you know, uh, especially uh, for all the people that have ever served. So thank you very much. But l let's get into kind of what made you decide to be a Navy SEAL? Uh, so I wanted to do something difficult, you know, when people ask me that question and I've thought a little bit about it now, cause the qu question comes up often. Uh, I, I always was looking for something that was personally challenging. I wasn't the most naturally talented person, uh, athletically growing up. I, uh, I just, I, I had to really work hard and I wanted to find something that I could apply myself to that required uh, a tremendous amount of personal discipline and that commitment and personal discipline would be the, the thing that would drive success, not necessarily innate athletic ability or just innate talent. So uh, I gravitated towards the SEAL teams because it was really difficult. I knew I could apply myself diligently in a disciplined way and, uh, and get results. And, uh, and, and that happened. I, I kind of fixated on it early in life, right around seventh grade, uh, when a friend of mine had told me about the community and, and how difficult it was to, to enter that community specifically. Did someone tell you to be like, oh, you can't, you can never do it. Is that what I, pushed you? So, so my, the initial friend, a guy named Mike Hurley, who's a, a police officer in Chicago, he's the one that brought it up to me. He was a big fan of the Marine Corps. He wanted to be in the military and he mentioned the SEAL teams uh, and he was always super positive, but, but the second that I latched onto that concept and, and I was actually pretty vocal about it, uh, you know, growing up seventh, eighth grade high school, but I, I definitely had people close to me that told me, do you're crazy. There's no way you're going to do that. Uh, and, and if it added fuel to the fire, right. That's, that's typically what, what happens, right. People that are very driven get told that they can't do something and then you want to prove them wrong. And, and prove that you can, you're capable of controlling your own destiny. Yeah. I remember uh, I came back from college one time um, and my dad used to run all the time and we used to run this like one and a half mile loop. And he was like, Hey, can you run with me? I was like, yeah, I'll run with you. And literally he, we passed right in the very beginning, we passed this old guy just walking. And um, <laughs> when we got back around this loop, my dad was way ahead of me. And I was so embarrassed. I remember walking by the old guy and the old guy was like, well, you better get them next time or something. And then I saw something um, where people were doing this triathlon. And I told my dad, I said, I'm going to do a triathlon. Or, and, or, was, or maybe I told him I was going to do an Ironman or something. And, uh, and he's like, oh, you can't do that. And literally it fueled me. And I was like, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I just finished under the cut. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's good, right? Like that that external motivation is is motivation uh, yeah. and, and powerful motivation nonetheless. Yeah. So I heard a rule or, or I, I heard something, I guess you guys have, or maybe it's a rule. It's like a 70-30 or something where you feel like your body's like completely shot, but you still have a ton to go. Is that true? Or is it there's a 70-30 rule that I, I heard? So so I, I haven't heard of it specifically like that, but it it definitely makes sense. I mean, generally speaking, uh, we're limited by our mind, not by our body. And you know, I I've gone through a bunch of stuff in my personal life that uh, has shown me that. I mean, you know, growing up as an athlete and and not being 
as talented as everybody else, knowing that I could dig deep and that my, you know, my mind wanted to tell me to stop and, and to keep going. And, and then going into buds was a, a, another very pointed example of that, you know, that whole program, uh, you know, the seal selection and training program, uh, which is called buds, basic underwater demolition seal training it is, is structured to break every single person down to a point where you are not physically capable of doing it on your own. And you're not physically capable of just crushing it the entire time. It, it gets you to a point where you, you have to dig deeper. You have to uh, face kind of those, those mental barriers and then drive past them. And, and in doing so, you, you, you find out that you are capable of doing so much more than your mind is telling you you're capable or your body's uh, capable of uh, so much more than your mind thinks it is. I can only imagine that's got to be a humbling experience because I, I would, I would think, obviously I was not in the military and and it's a a regret I've had, but like, I could only imagine the people that go out, go through buds, they're probably at the top of their game. Um, on, on the physical ability and then just to be broken down and to have to depend on other people, I guess that's the whole design of it. So that's, um, it's really yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, um, we had, I mean, a huge amount of people that were tremendous athletes. I mean, very talented, like Olympic caliber athletes that faltered when things got really tough. Um, you know, and not necessarily the, on the physical side of things, but, uh, immersion into cold water is something that's a big, part of of our pipeline our selection pipeline and you know there's really nothing you can do it's like physically yeah you might be a bigger guy and you might be more insulated than than the guy that's you know 130 pounds next to you but both of you will get to a point where you're going to get cold and that's where like you really have to dig deep i mean that's where kind of that mental toughness and and kind of that ability to kind of drive past discomfort and push yourself beyond where you think you can go uh comes in so i saw guys that were tremendous athletes you know falter in that regard and then you know the counterpoint to that is i saw guys that you would have bet everything they would have failed because they just were not you know the most impressive physical specimens and they were the toughest guys that i went through training with and you know the uh the polar opposite of what you would imagine a seal candidate to look like you know they were maybe 15, 20 pounds overweight, you know, not athletic, you know, struggled in most of the physical evolutions, but could just crush it when things got extremely tough. That's awesome. So let's talk, let's talk about high pressure situations because, you know, obviously running an agency is very different than being, you know, um, (laughs) in the military and you guys have gone through a lot of high pressure situations being a SEAL and a lot of agency and entrepreneurs that think they're in high pressure situations for their business. Um, and, and I've always found when there's emotion or a lot of stress, or I guess stress creates emotion, which emotion creates bad decisions. Um, how did you guys, how did you guys learn how to deal with that and to get that under control in order to make the right decision? Yeah. I mean, so just dealing with stress, right? I mean, stress is stress, regardless of of where uh, the origin of that stress is coming from. Um, You know, whether it be, you know, high risk financial decisions as an agency owner or uh, an element leader in a SEAL platoon in combat, I mean, you're still gonna be exposed to stress. And in our community, you know, we, we train a lot. We train significantly more than the time that we actually spend in direct combat operations. Um, I mean, there's guys pre 9-11 that didn't really get to see any combat and spent 20, 30 years in training, basically preparing for that opportunity to excel in kind of the high stress kind of game day scenario. And I would say that that that, uh, extreme level of preparation or commitment to preparation uh, becomes a stress inoculator. It, you know, the, the, the training that I went through and I, I've referred to this example several times, and, it, and I will continue to refer to it. Um, Jocko Willink, who is a, a very well-known SEAL, uh, owns Echelon Front, uh, which is a consultancy uh, here in the States. 
Jocko was my uh, sister troop commander. He also put me through training when I was a platoon commander and he was running our training detachment on the West Coast. And I specifically remember multiple uh, times during my training where I, I felt significantly more stress because I knew I was being critiqued by someone that I respect and I was being critiqued by my peers in that kind of uh, high performance training scenario. I felt more stressed there than I did in actual combat operations. You know, I, I, and I, I have uh, memories of being in uh, direct engagement with the enemy, you know, receiving incoming enemy fire and, and making calls and making decisions on the battlefield and feeling more comfortable and more confident uh, because of the training, that high stakes, uh, high level, high stress training that I went through. So, you know, it's a testament to the fact that, you know, preparation breeds inoc inoculation to stress and will allow you to control those emotions that seem to overwhelm people that are ill prepared. Yeah. You know, whenever I think about the points in my life when was the most stressful, it was really, it came down to being prepared or not being sure. prepared. Like, I just was like, I kind of wing it. I, I'll be good at that five pitch. <laughs> and then I would go in being like, holy cow. But then, you know, if I look at situations where I felt totally relaxed, it was, I've done this a thousand times. Like you were yep. saying that repetition and I was just prepared. And I was just like, you know, now I can get on, like I look at getting on stage because a lot of people fear getting on stage. And I remember when I ran the agency, I would get on stage and I would talk about stuff I really didn't know about. <laughs> just to get on stage. Sure. But that now I get on stage and talking about, you know, running an agency, I'm like, you yeah, ask me anything. Like I feel totally prepared. Like there, you can't throw me any curveballs. Yeah. And um, that is so true. Um, yeah, there, I guess it, there, there is no easy uh, solution, right? You got to put the work in, you have to be well prepared. And, and it's, it, it's, you know, it, it was evident in every single thing that we did in the SEAL teams, you know, whether it was the training scenarios, uh, whether it was our mission planning and kind of the preparation uh, prior to going out on an actual real world operation, you know, we prepared diligently. Uh, we exhausted every scenario that we possibly could think through in order to contingency plan and, and really try to have the answers before the test. You know, we, we tried to go through everything and come up with uh, theoretical problems and solutions and did it in a manner where everybody on the team understood what those scenarios could be and, and how we would potentially address them. And 99% of the time, we never even had to address those contingencies on the actual operation. The operation typically would just be easy, right? But it's that 1% opportunity where the, the something bad goes wrong and you have to deal with it. And if you know what you are going to do ahead of time, because you've already talked through it with your team, emotion doesn't even play into it. You go into autopilot and you just start addressing the issues and taking care of business. How, um, other than just putting your, your team through repetition, repetition, and let's think about it on, on a, on a business front, right? Because, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of leaders, you know, they hear that, you know, they hear you talking about that and they're like, well, it's a life death situation. Like they have to do it all. But I, and a lot of business leaders, including me sometimes, and, and I'm actually going to think about the way I do it is like, we don't have time to plan for every single result. We'll just go, we'll react and then we'll react to however it happens, mm -hmm. which, which is probably the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, like like because if you told people like hey your life depends on this don't you want to think of every result like what do you say to those people yeah i mean but i mean even as a as a business leader you have the opportunity to put systems in place right i mean you know let's, let's say on the sales front um you, you know you can put together your targets you can talk about how you approach those targets uh the way that you're going to pitch certain people because it's different every single time uh, you're going to bring different people on your team uh, to certain pitches because they're going to be received better by certain demographics that you're pitching to. And you, 
you can plan all of that stuff. And, and there's, it's not a waste of time and energy to do that. I mean, you, you're going to know your team better by, by doing that, by digging in and understanding who every single, what strengths each and every person on your team has, you're going to be able to tap the, into those strengths, uh, easier, uh, more fluidly and be able to apply those strengths from your team appropriately in the right pitches. And then, you know, the, the actual pitch itself, you know, it, it turned, it, it becomes pretty robotic and pretty structured, you know, it's not like there's a tremendous amount of variance in, in kind of pitching to a new client, you know, you can, you can really lay that stuff out well. And, and even, you know, you should be practicing that you should huddle as a team. You should have people practicing kind of their pitch. Uh, the way that they, they converse with you is the way they're going to converse with the client. So, you know, I know people may say, yeah, you know, we, we just read and react and, uh, and we don't have time to do this, but, I don't think you have time not to do that because if you get in front of somebody that's a decision maker, I mean, that's life and death financially. I mean, it's, it's, I, people will, will downplay it and say, Oh yeah, well you're, you're in combat. Yeah. It is life and death. Yeah. True. You know, you're not going to die uh, in a pitch if you lose, but you know, if you lose a big pitch and you're in financial dire straits, I mean, that's, I, I could I could say this. I said this before we started our call. Uh, <laughs> I I would be more stressed, and I probably would allow that to impact me more emotionally if I was in a situation where I I felt out of control and I I lost my financial security and I couldn't take care of my family. Um, you know that it, that still produces a extreme high level of stress. So I think it all it's all relative. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I remember one time we, we over-prepared for this one pitch going in. And I remember just going in, they were like, yeah, we'll decide with you. I'm like, but I was thinking in my mind, we were so prepared. We need all, you know, like you need to ask us this question so we can like, it wasn't wasted time. But it, you know, it wasn't wasted. Um, yeah. It made us that much better for the next pitch, the next campaign, the next, you know, initiative that we needed to do. Sure. Uh, let's change focus a little bit around building your team and being a good leader. Um, how did you guys select who you wanted on your team and, and really kind of get them to the next level where everybody was, you know, in sync? Because it's the same within business. Like you have to get the right people in the right seat, all that believe in that certain vision or mission ahead of you. Sure. Well, so in the SEAL teams, I almost, I, I would think it's actually easier because our selection, you know, we all go through the same selection process. Um, you know, you get, for the most part, you get a tremendous product on the back, back end of that selection product uh, process. And you get sent to a SEAL team and you get put into a platoon. And there's really, you know, you're not, you don't have people in the, in the background picking these people out, like handpicking them. You just get a bunch of SEALs. You get like, you get a rough cut, a uh, seal that has made it through the same selection process that every other seal has made it through. So you know you, what you have to start with. So as a leader, you know, that's easier, it, you know, for me, you know, I think it's actually leadership in the seal teams was easy because of that. Um, you know, as opposed to being in the civilian world where you don't necessarily get that high level selection process, you know, you get to interview somebody, maybe put them uh, on as an intern and get to see them perform for a period of time, but you don't really get them. You don't get to vet them for a year, a year and a half. And uh, for us, the leadership really, uh, I mean, leadership is always important, but it became critically important um, in the way that you, you, you grew your people, you leveraged their strengths and their weaknesses, and you slotted them into the right role with the right responsibilities uh, as part of that team. So, you know, I, I didn't have a choice as to who I got, but I did have a choice as to where I put those people on my, uh, on my team. Man, maybe I need to create buds for agency employees. <laughs> Be like, you know, get put the them, crop. <laughs> put them through like a six month, just grinder and just like every like high stress all day Code long. faster. <laughs> <laughs> Your color's off. What are you talking about? But, but you know what, from a, a leadership standpoint, to give you more of a, 
a granular answer. You know, we, you know, trust and respect are, are two big things uh, in as far as leadership is concerned, successful leadership in the, in any, in any team. Um, and, and also humility uh, as, as a leader. So being humble enough to know that you don't have all the answers. Um, and even if you're in a position of leadership where you are accountable, you still should never say, I need to be the end all be all. I need to know everything. I mean, it's great. You should tap in and try to learn as much as you can, but be humble enough to know that you're not the expert. You got people on your team that are absolute experts in the role that they're there to execute. And in the SEAL teams, you know, we had people that breached doors. We had people that were snipers. We had people that were communicators. We had medic, uh, people that uh, conducted all of our medical training and, and cared for our unit uh, from a medical standpoint. And, I, you know, as a leader, I wanted to know the capabilities that each of those people brought to the team but they were the expert and I needed to be uh, trusting enough and confident enough in their ability to perform and to be experts in their field, to allow them to do their job effectively, let them lead in their own right, in their lane, and then be able to apply those strengths at the appropriate times in order to put together a successful operation. Yeah, I think the perception too, and, and, and I learned this the, the hard way, and, and I guess a lot of people listening, you know, they think of Navy SEALs, all alphas, right? And you're probably alphas in your own realm. But I think you mentioned the key word, you know, humility and being humble um, to know that they not, don't know everything. Because I remember I was looking for this graphic designer many years ago. And I remember coming across, they were the most amazing designer I've ever seen on this one particular thing. But they were the cockiest son of a bitch I've ever met. And I was like, I cannot put this poison in this company. Um, even though they're the best, they're not the best for the team, you know, going forward. Um, now, I also heard, I heard a story. Now, this is not around Navy SEALs, but I want to understand how you guys make decisions um, as a team, um, yep. as well as as a leader. I was listening to a podcast. I had Scott Kelly on, the, you know, the astronaut that lived in the space for a year. And I think they had some problems with the heat shield. And, uh, you know, you know, NASA was like, hey, you know, it's your decision. And he said, I could have asked everyone in a group setting, you know, what do you guys think we should do? Should we go out, do a spacewalk, fix it? Or should we just, which could actually damage it more? Or should we just come down? And he said, he goes, we actually, um, I went to everyone individually and asked them rather than having, you know, a committee make the decision. What were kind of like your decision process when you were leading your team? Yeah, so, you know, I will, uh, I'll refer back to kind of my Afghan deployment, my last deployment, um, active duty deployment as a SEAL, you know, I went into a platoon that uh, had some leadership issues, and I was replacing a another officer that had been removed from the platoon. So kind of a broken scenario, a lot of distrust, a lot of uh, internal conflict. And I was showing up from a different theater. I came from Iraq and I was going into Afghanistan. And what I did initially is just sit back and listen. Um, listen to each, I mean, I think it's important when you have the time, when you're not in the high stress scenario, is, is get to know the people that are in your team. Uh, listen to them. Don't just talk, right? <laughs> the more you can shut your mouth and, and listen, you learn a tremendous amount. And what I learned in listening is who are, who are the trusted experts? Who are the people that, that really have a finger on the pulse and know how other people in the team are feeling? And uh, I, you know, I, I was able to gauge the level of credibility of each individual that I listened to. And by doing that, I basically formed this, uh, this uh, abstract advisory board within my team where when things got, you know, when things were, uh, I guess, getting more high pressure and we needed to make some serious decisions and decisions that were going to be high stakes, you know, we're, you know, we're going into a dangerous area or we were going to do a certain type of operation. I could always go back and I could talk to some of these, 
these uh, critical leaders within my element because I've already vetted them and I knew who I could go to, uh, who was credible and who was capable of giving me sound advice. And I think in doing that, I was able to confidently make decisions because ultimately as the leader, the, the top person in a unit, I'm accountable for the decision. So as much as I want to take the advice of everybody else and the council, when it comes down to it, I need to be confident in making the decision. And I got to be the one that falls on the sword if things go wrong, uh, because I'm definitely the one that's getting the credit when things go right. You know, So I need to be willing to accept that level of accountability and stand on my own two feet. What were some of the questions that you would ask when you were coming in in order to get them just, because a lot of times I would think, you know, as a leader comes into an organization that has a little, you know, little funk going on, some people are going to be a little standoffish or be like, you know, what are you going to do for me? Yeah. What were some of the questions that kind of disarmed that? Well, I think empowering people, right? So like giving people the opportunity to say, hey, like, what have you seen go right? What have you seen go wrong? Uh, what are things that you would would change or what changes would you enact uh, if you were given the opportunity to do that? And then not just kind of hypothetically talking about it, but actually empowering people and letting them make decisions. You know, as the leader, you don't always have to be the one that's making uh, kind of, you're making, you're, you're accountable for the final call, but you don't have to be the one that makes that final call. There was a lot of times that, I mean, I'd say typically our mission planning process was uh, allowing each individual kind of unit or element within the bigger element to actually run the planning process and make decisions as to where they're going to place themselves, how they're going to execute a micro portion of the plan. And they'd actually go through, brief that, and they would brief all the contingencies associated with that micro portion of the bigger plan. So in essence, I'm allowing them, I'm empowering them as leaders in their own right to make decisions, to build confidence. So they already are like, hey, you know what? I'm not only, you know, the leader isn't, you know, the, the high level leader isn't just asking me for my opinion. That leader is actually allowing me to make decisions and trust me to make decisions that he's cool with, he's ready to execute on. So I think that's important. It's like, don't just be talk. Don't just be kind of, don't give people the warm and fuzzy. Actually trust people. Show that you are confident in their ability to make decisions and, and execute on things. Yeah, I love that. What, um, how, you know, going, what was the, the major decision for really kind of leaving the SEALs and going kind of the, the corporate, you know, or the, the civilian route? Uh, so... So I had uh, a bit of an unconventional transition, I guess. I, uh, <clears throat> I came off my last deployment and I think two things for me happened that really changed uh, the dynamic. A as a SEAL officer, I knew that I was 100% committed to my job, uh, to being a combat leader, leading men well in combat and, and making sure that I make sound decisions that are gonna put them first and, and bring them home safe. And uh, my, my wife got pregnant with our first child, our, our daughter. Uh, and, and that was, it was a big deal. And I, not necessarily the, the linchpin catalyst that led to my decision to leave, uh, but it definitely weighed in. And the, the second major event in my life was my, my younger brother, my middle brother, uh, Chris was killed in an inbounds avalanche in, uh, Winter Park, Colorado. Hmm. So, <clears throat> my little brother uh, left behind a, a wife and, and two young kids. And, you know, they were the first ones to, to know that my wife was pregnant with our first. And it really was a perspective shift for me. You know, I got to see what my, fa my brother's family went through in losing him. And knowing that I was about to become a father uh, I, you know, it was much easier for me to visualize the very real possibility of, of me, you know, being killed, um, or just frankly being taken from my family for long periods of time in training, um, with the, the level of commitment that I owed to the SEAL team. So, uh, it was a, it was a perspective shift there 
that led to me saying, okay, I'm going to get out. Uh, I want to focus on my family. I want to be there for my family and, and other loved ones in my life. And, uh, and at that point I, I said, I, you know, <laughs> I wanted to reinvent myself. I wanted to prove people wrong. I wanted to prove that I could do something besides being a combat leader. I wanted to prove that I could actually be successful in a career outside of the military with direct kind of uh, gun toting skills that I <laughs> was coming to the table with. <laughs> oh, fair enough. I mean, I, I totally get that. You know, I, I used to race cars and, um, you know, I started seeing some of our, our friends that I would know would get injured. And I was just, you know, right when I had my second son, I was like, I don't want to put like, I was like you, I was like, if I get hurt, I get hurt. Um, and then I was like, but it's going to affect my family going forward. Sure. And, and so it's kind of why I kind of hung up the race suit. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's, it's always, it's always a good exercise yeah. to step back and, kind of evaluate your priorities at any point in life. And I think the more frequent you can do that exercise, the better off you are because it, it makes sure that you're staying on track, right? I mean, if you don't do that exercise from time to time, you're going to slowly but surely deviate from course to to a point where if if too much time elapses, you know, you may find yourself in a in a in a pretty bad place and uh you know, and I, I wouldn't say I am immune to that because I have I have spoke very openly and very freely about my own personal struggles and and kind of losing course post transition, and it kind of losing focus on the priorities that led me to transitioning from the SEAL teams in the first place. Yeah, that's great. Last last question, um, I forgot to ask was around. Have you ever had to replace a teammate? Well, so yeah, I mean, in my on that that last deployment to Afghanistan, you know, I I replaced a teammate that was, uh, you know, that was removed, relinquished from a leadership uh, role over in Afghanistan, and you know that that was, I mean, that is the that was the biggest uh, learning experience for me as a leader to be able to step into a broken scenario, um, and and have to figure it out right? Have to win people over that don't necessarily know you very well and, and kind of win that confidence and that trust, you know, in a short period of time. Well, when you, when you came into that environment though, was there anybody that you had to replace, you know, going in or make that hard decision be like, that person on the team is not the right fit? Yeah. So let me think about it. I, uh, I, so in that scenario, I was not the one that had to pull the trigger and, mm -hmm. and replace that person. Um, we did replace, uh, people in previous platoons and, and it's never easy. Right. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I think the, the things that we did right. And we often did this because it was protocol in the SEAL teams is we, we brought the issue up early and often. It was never a surprise for the person. If it was a surprise, it actually uh, tied our hands in our ability to remove that individual from a position, R regardless of whether it's a leadership position, uh, a high-level leadership position, or just a, mm -hmm. a position within a, uh, uh, a SEAL platoon. You know, we, we executed uh, counseling um, multiple times, and everything was recorded, and the person was very clear as to what our expectations were what, where they were falling short, because if you don't give people clear expectations and you don't give them uh, defined objectives for them to hit that are metrics of their performance, how can you hold them accountable? How can you, I think you are failing as a leader if you're not clear and you're not giving them those well-defined objectives. I mean, you, that's, you know, you should be looking at replacing yourself or counseling yourself if you're not doing that. So if you're, if you're pulling somebody into your office to, to tell them that you want to, you're going to let them go. And that person is surprised or is, is hearing those things for the first time. It's absolutely the wrong uh, way to approach that scenario. Yeah. Looking back, I've, I've done that so many times in the very early years. Like I, and I just go, I'm like, man, why did I have to surprise them? Like if I just kind of let them know my expectation the whole way 
and kind of just seed it the right way, it could have turned out totally different. Yeah, it's um, it's it's always tough, right? To be, I mean, direct communication is scary for a lot of people. People don't like confrontation in in the outside world. Uh, it's it's difficult to sit face to face with somebody and and tell somebody that they're they're failing at something, you know, or that you know you're disappointed in them. Uh, it's easy to tell them when they're you know they're hey they're you're doing a great job and you're exceeding expectations, but but people just they they shy away from from confrontation and conflict. And, you know, I've noticed, and I've learned this myself because it's tougher on the outside because I, I am dealing with people that I did not have go through a selection process. Right. So, you know, sometimes I'm bringing people in, and I think they're going to be the best person ever to fill that role. <laughs> and three months later, I'm finding out that they are inadequate, uh, you know, might've might not uh, have had the skill set that they they came into it saying they did, and they might even have personality traits that are cancerous within the 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 unit. And you know, direct communication. The times that I've been direct and very clear with my expectations and kind of clear in their critique, the critique of their uh, execution in their role, um, it's been so much easier than those times where I've shied away from it. And, yeah. and they don't know, they can't read your mind. They don't hear the, the conversations that you're having with your business partners about how you're disappointed in somebody. I mean, it's like, you got to tell people or they're never going to be able to fix it. Well, I, I think as, as leaders, if I think back at kind of the early years, I think it was, comes down to a couple, I think two things. It's comes down to, you don't know the solution that they actually need to go do, right? To right. fix it. Or you feel like a, a bad leader because you don't know the solution for them to right. do it. And then just this resentment builds up and then it just pops one day and exactly. then you surprise them. And then it's just, it's not good for, for anyone. So right. uh, it's, yeah, it's crazy. Well, this has all been uh, amazing, Nick. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you think would benefit the listeners? Oh, I mean, I, 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 it's tough. There's so much to talk about. I mean, we could, we could talk leadership and, uh, and, and various scenarios all day long. So I'm happy to do it anytime, brother. Awesome. I appreciate it. Is, uh, if anybody ever wants to reach out to you or, you know, uh, go to your business, support charity, where can they go? Yeah. I mean, so for me personally, I'm on Instagram, uh, pretty easy to find there. I think I'm Nick underscore Norris 1981. And, uh, my business is protectproducts.com, protect with a K, and okay. we're we're at Protect Life on Instagram. And then uh, for the charity, I, I would say uh, the C4 Foundation. Um, it's a charity that I am intimately involved with. I I am I am currently filling the uh, the executive director role um, in combination with my my efforts uh, as an entrepreneur, <laughs> and. Uh, so I have a little bit going on, but uh, C4 Foundation was named after Charles Humphrey Keating IV, who's a friend of mine that was killed in combat in the SEAL teams uh, about four years ago in northern Iraq. And the, the foundation is building a 560-acre ranch, uh, about an hour and a half outside of San Diego, uh, in order to be a sanctuary for Navy SEAL families to kind of grow connection within their individual family unit and grow connection amongst kind of other families to, to kind of build that organic support mechanism uh, for guys and, and their families um, as, you know, they go through their deployments on active duty. And then when they finally leave uh, active duty, they have people that they can lean on. So uh, c4foundation.org is a phenomenal organization that I'm involved with. And uh, if you want to check it out, there's some really cool videos on the website. Awesome. Well, everybody go there. If you guys enjoyed this episode and you want to support the, the great cause that they do, please go there. Um, that would be great. Thanks, Nick, for everything that you've done and you're doing uh, currently um, and giving us your most valuable asset, your time. And uh, if you guys like this episode, make sure you guys uh, subscribe, make sure you guys uh, give it a good rating. And uh, yeah, and uh, until next time, have a swank day. <laughs>